and think we are just about live, Jeff. One second. All right, everyone, welcome. And I'm excited that you folks decided to take some time out of your busy schedules uh, to join Jeff and I today. So we're going to sit tight here for just a minute just to make sure everybody can keep joining in, uh, just get settled. So if anybody needs to, please go grab a snack. Feel free to re up on some coffee. Uh, we're just going to continue to let folks roll in for about another minute or so. Uh, and I'm coming to you guys from my home in Bozeman, Montana where XYPN is headquartered. And looking outside here, we finally got rid of all the snow on the ground and it is May. So hopefully this is the last time that we'll see that stuff probably until September, I imagine. Hopefully you guys don't have to deal with that, Jeff, down in St. Louis. But it looks like we're a little bit past the hour now. So uh, to introduce myself again, thank you guys for joining us. My name is Chris Johnson, and I'm one of the lead business development specialists here on our XYPN sales team. And today I'm excited to host the webinar titled How to Be Your Own Chief Investment Officer for Your Fee-Only Firm. And this is going to be with our director of XY Investment Solutions, Jeff Snodgrass. And there are just a few housekeeping items uh, I'd like to go over briefly um, so if you folks could just take a look on the right of your screen here, you will see there is a chat function uh, at the top. So please feel free to chime in uh, with any comments or questions. And then right below that, we do have a questions tab as well where you can submit uh, any questions live and we will address those um, once Jeff is ready for his Q&A session. Right below that, you will see polls um, tab. I believe, Jeff, you have one uh, or one or two polls uh, that he's going to be doing today. Um, and that will be just about it for me. And then one quick reminder, folks, we do host these webinars on the first Wednesday of every single month. So please be sure to register for next month's webinar. It is going to be a compliance topic. So it's called Compliance Basics, and it's going to be on everything you need to know about registering your firm. And it will be with Kendra Ramden, who is our manager of investment advisor registrations, uh, as well as Kelsey Rich, who is our senior compliance specialist. And this will take place on June 1st. And I think that's it for me, Jeff. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's hot and humid here in St. Louis. We went through a month of rain in April, and then May's hitting us hard with the heat. It feels like uh, July temps outside. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah our our. Our humidity is very different than uh, what, what you experience in Bozeman. Um, dry and cold. Very yeah. dry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty unpleasant here. Yes. Well, welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you. My name is Jeff Snodgrass. I'm the director of XY Investment Solutions. I'll give just a really brief background on uh, my career so you know where I'm coming from, and then we'll dive right in. So I first got introduced to XY Planning Network as a prospective member. And in 2016, I joined the network and they helped me launch my own independent registered investment advisory practice. So that's um, how I first got introduced. Then I actually joined part-time on staff to help roll out uh, the Orion uh, effort. So XY Investment Solutions resells the Orion technology platform, if you're familiar with that. And so I've been uh, associated with the team ever since. I actually still have my own independent RAA and uh, also managing director of XY Investment Solutions. Now, um, today's topic is uh, design from the lens of the planning first uh, advisor. So what I mean is our typical user is leading with financial planning services. Many of them add investment management, but not all. And those who do often outsource it. So um, that's, that's the lens through which all of this uh, content is written. So um, first and foremost, let's lay out what is 
a chief investment officer. And this is just taken from Investopedia, but it, it seems like um, a fair source to kind of set uh, the groundwork here. So the, the CIO is the executive position responsible for setting the investment style and strategy of a firm's investments. And then more specifically, they're involved in sourcing, managing, monitoring the investments, establishing an investment policy statement and working with external managers, analysts, and investors. So as you build your practice, what you're gonna be thinking about is how many of these roles can you fulfill? If you happen to be like the typical profile like I described as a planning focused advisor, and if you think you're gonna add investment management as another service to your practice, then you, you need to be ready for uh, all of these components laid out here in the definition of the CIO. Um, so before we go much further, I wanna see who do we have present here today? Uh, Chris is gonna share the poll for us and I just want you to respond with any designations that you have or your primary designation and um, let's see what we get. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, for those of you who are CFPs and not CFAs, um, you might think there's more overlap than there might really be between those two designations. Um, many, uh, many of us are born out of the same practices. I know I was uh, raised up in a firm where we were providing both planning and investment management, and many of us wore hats, uh, uh, CFP type hats and CFA type hats, depending on what we were doing day to day. But um, yeah, okay, so just like I would have thought, primarily uh, CFPs, um, almost 80% CFPs present, but uh, still a sprinkling of uh, CFAs and and CFPs, or CPAs, sorry. <laughs> All right, so um, next up, let's talk about who is a CIO. And taken from a sample job description, what you see here is someone who is um, uh, fact-based, details and number-driven, strong analytical background, uh, designs efficient systems, seeks productivity, direct and thorough in communications, uh, potentially 10 years experience and advanced degrees. So all that's pretty interesting. And especially, uh, let's compare that to skills needed or desired for a CFP or a lead financial planner, someone who's gonna be engaging directly with clients to help them craft their financial plans. And what you see is that the CFP hopefully has uh, more advanced listening skills, empathy, relationship building, trust, people skills. And uh, it's not that the CIO, CIO can't have those, but it's definitely a completely different profile. And we draw the distinction there because um, many times we have CFPs who are considering adding investment management and struggling with the decision around, can they take on all these tasks? Well, they certainly can. If you want to run uh, an RIA and wear both the um, CFP hat and the CIO hat, that's, that's totally acceptable. The thing we're calling out here is that the skills required for each are so different. And um, if, if you're focused more in one area over the other, then uh, it might not be the best decision. Certainly not prescriptive here, just trying to highlight that consideration. Uh, there's certainly a percentage of those on this call who have uh, aspects of both. There's no denying that. Now, um, if you want to build a lifestyle practice, that's certainly another consideration because um, you might not take on enough clients to um, fill your time with financial planning alone. 
Uh, if you're going to build an enterprise and you have other advisors potentially dependent on you as the leader of the firm for these um, skills, then that might be a, a harder decision there. So uh, let's talk about the CFA designation for a moment. Uh, roots back to the 40s for the purpose of formalizing and advocating uh, for the financial analysis profession, maintaining strict code of con conduct uh, requires four years minimum work experience uh, before or after uh, passing the exams and a minimum of two reference letters. So um, it's uh, quite an intense process uh, split across these three exams covering ethics, econ, corporate finance, security analysis, stats, asset class analysis, portfolio management, and wealth planning. All right, so what does the CIO do? Uh, in larger firms, a CIO may oversee a team that performs many of these tasks, but in uh, smaller firms, like what most of our attendees here are gonna be building, uh, the CIO likely performs all of these and uh, oversees the underlying processes as well, in addition to doing all of the financial planning. Uh, since so many of our uh, attendees here will be solo practitioners. Now, uh, the key responsibilities um, shown here represent most of what the CIO would be doing. Uh, there's no way we can address uh, all of the underlying tasks here, but this is a good representative sample. So you've got um, quite a lot going on here, and uh, much of this does not overlap with your CFP functions. So related to the daily tasks of financial planning for your clients, um, this, these all pretty much represent a completely different set of functions and responsibilities far beyond that uh, financial planning. Now, um, next up, uh, we'll start talking about in more detail each of the various components uh, that the CIO would be uh, fulfilling for your practice. So first up is your overall investment philosophy and approach. Now, um, this is not likely to be a recurring process. This is usually something that you're considering in the early days of launching your firm. You might periodically uh, shift or amend this over time, but um, the distinction is that some of the later tasks we'll discuss uh, in the presentation after this will be more um, more um, periodic, you know, monthly or quarterly type things. So first up, for your in overall investment philosophy, uh, will we stick to publicly traded assets like stocks and bonds, or will we go into alternatives? And even beyond that, uh, would we include any uh, uh, private investments as well? Um, Diversification, are we gonna be globally diversified or US centric? Is this tailored for our client base or is it tailored to our personal beliefs? So if it's tailored to our client base, we're talking there about uh, where are uh, your clients um, needing global equity, needing global equity uh, exposure, excuse me. So uh, in, in some cases, you have firms where you have more international clients with um, employers who are based overseas. And so you might consider in those cases a more US-centric investment approach. Um, in other cases, they might not have any uh, exposure like that through their employment. And a, a more globally diversified approach would be more suitable. Um, next up, individual securities. Uh, are we going to be using common stocks or mutual funds, ETFs? And then how knowledgeable are we about ETF trading? Uh, near the end of the presentation, we'll 
bring that up again in terms of uh, knowledge on ETF trading. And active versus passive, are we a blend of both or are we strictly focusing on one or the other? And how flexible or how rigid are we going to be? If we uh, proceed with a passive investment philosophy and we have a prospective client who comes asking for more active approach, will we have the structure in place to support that? Um, strategic or tactical. Uh, if, if tactical, uh, based upon what signals uh, are we going to use fundamental, technical, gut instinct, um, and then finally values-based, ESG, faith-based, all these things to lay out in the early days before you get into the nitty-gritty. Nitty um, these higher-level issues are important to kind of set in stone before um, you take the next step. Okay, so uh, next up is model portfolios. Um, in many cases, firms will build centralized model portfolios, and uh, it helps deploy these models uh, quickly and easily and efficiently. Um, for some firms, this still allows for customization if uh, clients need uh, things amended for special circumstances. Um, others have a very strict process here and, and just adopt one set of models that they do not edit. So in consideration here, how many model portfolios and why? Um, in some cases, uh, firms are strict about limiting the list. Um, in other cases, I've seen firms where they're um, pretty loose about building a wide variety. Um, are we going to um, alternate portfolios for tax-sensitive accounts or small accounts? Uh, are we going to consider any kind of um, no transaction fee fund lists uh, for your custodian? Uh, those lists are constantly evolving and uh, can sometimes raise surprises. Uh, we had a recent example in our uh, TAMP models where we build uh, one particular model for beginners. And um, in that model, we use two mutual funds to make it easy for someone to get started and implement the whole model uh, with small balances. And Schwab surprised us with trade commissions on the funds we used. They had previously been uh, no transaction fee funds. So in that case, we made the decision to switch and um, just a, an example of how sometimes these things, uh, you can plan them out in advance and you still might uh, be surprised. Next, are we going to limit to a handful of investment companies or managers? Are we willing to accept calls from the thousands of mutual funds, uh, the wholesalers <laughs> calling in the U.S.? And uh, are we going to have the capacity to uh, take new companies into consideration. And then finally, the frequency. So ongoing but thorough annual review at a minimum. And then what does that review look like? What components of the model are we reviewing? And um, what data will we track to support our reviews? Obviously, there's a compliance burden here to track all of your work, and so you'll want to be thoughtful about uh, taking on a workload that's uh, bearable. All right, so um, now we've got to choose our tools. This is a, a screenshot from the Kitsis FinTech map. You can see uh, all of the FinTech options available to us advisors. And uh, this, is, this is pretty fascinating. So on um, our TAMP, we have a partnership with East Bay Investment Solutions. And uh, for investment research there, they have uh, subscriptions to Morningstar. And that satisfies most of the needs of uh, East Bay and our advisors on our TAMP. 
but you can see how um, how overwhelming this can be if you need to go on the hunt for products to support your work as CIO. All right, so for model reviews, uh, you'll want to take a close look to reaffirm or rethink your strategic allocations. Are the models compatible uh, to our trading tools, guidelines, processes, and are our accounts out of their target allocation due to model construction and trading restrictions? And then review performance against benchmarks. Determine if out or underperformance is due to your strategic allocations and is there a periodic deviation from benchmarks, uh, something uh, you and your clients want to tolerate. Um, a, a lot, a lot going on here, and I think really the the main message is is just documenting um, all of this work here is um, is is critical to document in your compliance. Uh, files, and you want to create a system for doing each of these uh, checkpoints in your reviews uh, such that it's repeatable. Document exactly how you're extracting the data, what systems you're pulling it from, uh, and then any additional work done to uh, synth synthesize the data uh, before making your final decision. Now one layer deeper, uh, product reviews or the security reviews. So here you might wanna compare versus benchmarks and peers over relevant time periods. Um, in our case, um, we're always looking at uh, three years and beyond. So the shorter time periods might be relevant for a live product inside of our models. Um, and those audits are certainly worthwhile, but in terms of um, our, our true manager due diligence, it's all three, five, uh, 10 and inception. Now you wanna understand the nuances about your product and the reference points. Did your small cap under, underperform because it tracks an index methodology that considers relatively bigger stocks? So you may have uh, added a small cap fund to your lineup that is slightly more small than um, that, uh, that asset class's benchmark that you've chosen. And in that case, how are you gonna document, document the difference there and communicate that with uh, any interested parties? So if this is a consideration uh, that you need to reveal to end clients or reveal to other advisors in your firm. How are you communicating that? Um, now, next up, uh, analysis and commentary. So your clients will want to know that you are paying attention to the markets. Some of this comes by way of periodic performance reporting whether you distribute that on an automated schedule or periodically when you're live together in a meeting. Um, but beyond that, they also want to hear from you uh, your feedback on what's going on in the markets. So there's a distinction here that's really important to understand. Many of the advisors in our audience are not uh, market timers. And so market commentary from a non-market timer is critically different from those who are trading tactically and timing the market. Um, the, the audience that's typical for us here is going to talk about the market in such a way that you're trying to demonstrate your knowledge and awareness mm -hmm. of what might be happening. Whereas um, a, a firm who is, is more inclined to do market timing or tactical trading is trying to convey uh, certain knowledge and um, 
considerations and expectations about what might happen. So if you see the distinction there, the typical advisor uh, in our audience is still on the hook to communicate about markets and uh, market considerations and things going on in the world. Um, many uh, kind of forget and miss that opportunity because they're so focused on the fact that they're not interested in market timing, but um, that's still an important consideration here. So if you're gonna take on this task of CIO in your practice, you wanna be ready for that and, and think through thoroughly how you're going to assemble your commentary and customize it to your investment philosophy and how you're gonna communicate that with, um, with those interested. Um, the CIO might even start the day by scanning headlines. That's, that's a, a shock to some people because uh, they're so used to ignoring uh, market news and so focused on long-term planning that they uh, don't see the need for um, being on top of the headlines. But the reality is the headlines will help determine when commentary might be due. On a typical cycle, you might uh, produce it monthly or quarterly, but um, beyond that, you might have other critically important opportunities to convey new commentary in between those uh, scheduled times. So finally, we're getting into the actual portfolio management and trading. So large firms often have dedicated trading firms um, but the smaller firms with a CIO or just one or two investment focused team members typically place trading uh, with uh, these team members, the planners and the uh, executives or the solo practitioner owns all of these responsibilities. So we're talking about um, rebalancing policies, uh, cash reviews, dividend reinvestment policies, tax loss harvesting policies. Um, model selection, asset location, and withdrawal order in terms of your spend down strategies. Um, as a solo practitioner, you'll be responsible for uh, monitoring, tracking, uh, documenting, and amending all of these things. Um, some sample trading policies, uh, if we focus in uh, more closely on ETF trading, for example, um, these are uh, common things taken from ETF.com, uh, but for example, don't trade at open or close, use limit orders, watch the spreads, and so on. You'll want to be uh, carefully considering these things uh, if rolling out your own uh, CIO program for your practice. And then finally, just a few other tasks, uh, nothing to be taken that lightly, but client performance review meetings, prospect portfolio analysis, uh, capital market assumptions is probably one of the biggest I can think of uh, that comes up in these considerations, uh, white papers, education, responses to questions, and so on. Yeah, capital market assumptions are a big deal for um, the advisors I interact with because they're constantly trying to zero in and they're planning on what to expect out of their investment accounts. Now, even if you're not taking on investment management in your practice, you still might have a need for um, many of these things because you're going to be talking to clients about investments held away. Uh, you might have um, less a direct responsibility to produce some of these things, but for the most part, there's still an important consideration. Um, obviously, the, the goal here is to try and lay out a realistic expectation for your role as a CIO, if you're gonna take that on yourself, um, and uh, potentially open your mind to the idea of 
using a TAMP service like XY Investment Solutions. But um, don't be afraid. If you think you've got these skills and more than uh, by all means, uh, we support you in your decision to do whatever you need for your practice. Um, with that, we'll take uh, questions and uh, see what else we can discuss. All right, everyone. Jeff, looks like we have a few live questions to address. This one coming from Jay Lee. Uh, how would you build an asset location process that can be scalable regardless of taxable versus tax advantage count sizes? Well, I'll start at the basics. So if you think of uh, the most core components of your portfolios, equity, bonds, and cash, then start there and say, if you want uh, your growth-oriented securities in taxable accounts, then mark that as the first priority for equity. Equity is bought in taxable accounts first. Then if you have a fixed income, if you want to shield your client's tax return from uh, income coming off of your bond portfolio, then you want to place those uh, as a priority in tax-deferred accounts and then work your way down from there. Roth accounts, you might uh, intend to spend last in your spend down strategy. So those might be considered primarily uh, state planning vehicles uh, where you want high growth. So put equity uh, as a priority in Roth accounts and the reverse for each. So we, we talked about putting bonds and tax deferred accounts first. Um, you may not be able to avoid putting it in Roth or taxable, but to decide uh, in what order. So if you start in tax deferred IRAs, where would you buy it next if you had to? And where would you buy it third after that? So don't overcomplicate it. Start really simple. And uh, you'll probably find other examples where you need a little bit more detail. Um, but I think you should be able to accomplish it pretty easily if you start there. Great. Thank you for that, Jeff. Good question, Jay. And it looks like uh, Jay does have another question here. I'll publish it for everyone to see. Is tactical asset allocation, overweighting a sector, cap style, et cetera, worth the effort for advisors to implement in your experience? Uh, alpha generation seems questionable versus the research involved. Um, I think the big thing here is that you're, if you're going to employ tactical asset allocation, you need to have the confidence that you're producing alpha yourself if you're the one calling the shots or you've identified uh, some third party that can do that for you and can prove their alpha. Um, we ultimately decide like in our case at XY Investment Solutions that it's it's not realistic. It's not a part of what we do. We don't see the benefit. And so we uh, deploy models based strictly on um, traditional asset allocation um, uh, deployment. So you decide how much equity, how much fixed, and then we rebalance regularly back to your target allocation. Good. And again, folks, please feel free to drop any live questions here uh, on the right side of the screen, uh, and uh, we'll get those addressed for you uh, by Jeff. Again, thanks for those questions, Jay. And then, Jeff, we do have a, a list of questions that were submitted before the webinar. Um, so I'll just kind of go through those and then just keep an eye on the questions tab for any live ones that may come through today. So I'll pull up. Uh, these pre-submitted questions for you and the first one that we have here it looks like could you talk about the logistics of charging flat fees that encompass both investment management and financial planning yeah so that's pretty common many advisors in our network will um, provide both financial planning and investment management for a flat retainer and i think that's totally acceptable um, the thing to take into consideration is what uh, costs you might have to roll out your investment management offering. 
and uh, is does the math all work out? So, for example, if you are paying basis points in any portion of the uh, tech or uh, operations um, uh, things needed to build your investment models and trade, then a, a flat fee model might be a struggle. But uh, if not, then uh, you just want to make sure it's accounting for all of the time and effort. So many advisors who come our way are really good about identifying a fee that covers the financial planning part of the relationship. If uh, you're going to add investment management into your retainer, then you just want to be really aware of what additional time you'll be spending doing that. Uh, it's certainly not zero. Uh, there's some, some amount of uh, time and cost involved. And uh, once you figure that out, I think you'll uh, have an easy time making that all, uh, all work. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, another question we have, I'm looking to increase our operational efficiency on the investment management side. What are some of my options? Um, my uh, um, first thought is that you consider either outsourced trading or a full service TAMP. Um, the, the distinction there would be outsourced trading would just strictly cover uh, trading uh, the models that you design. Now, a uh, full service TAMP, on the other hand, is likely to deliver models and potentially provide additional operational improvements like uh, back office support. In the example of XY Investment Solutions, uh, many advisors hire us first for outsourced trading. Uh, that's their primary focus, just figuring out how to get trading done uh, such that they don't have to staff up for it. Hmm. What they're often surprised to find out is that our back office support is uh, of equal importance and magnitude. So we'll we'll take the time to talk with the custodians when you have NIGOs. Uh, we'll figure out uh, custodial hurdles for you. Uh, we'll monitor ACATs inbound and uh, track those for you. So there's a, a lot of advantages of a full service TAMP and, and those services aren't unique to us. So it's, those are pretty common. But um, to summarize the outsource trading or a full service TAMP are the likely choices. Mm -hmm. um, now you certainly could review your tech. Maybe you don't have the right tech. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's awesome tech consultants. I can't, come up with a great uh, suggestion for that within XY Planning Network. But our members are great about that stuff. Uh, so as a member, you can engage with other members to figure out if there's any great recommendations on tech that others have used. Um, but also, if it's serious enough, you're always welcome to reach out. I'm happy to talk. Um, our TAMP is involved heavily in uh, both the full service offering with trading and back office support, but we also have a, a kind of a tech a la carte option uh, via Orion. So it just gives us some expertise in, in uh, both options that you might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely having that additional support and community will help streamline things. And it looks like we do have a couple of live questions, Jeff. So I'm going to flip back over to these for you. This one's coming from uh, Sue Gardner. Published this for you. Can an XYPN member hire XYIS to help set up uh, a member as their own CIO? Um, we, um, we probably don't have a package service for this. Wouldn't you say so, Chris? Right. I can't think of anything that is set up specifically for that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certainly components of it that uh, bleed into compliance. So our, our compliance support is exceptional and they can certainly help with the documentation and routine workflows you want to go through on the compliance side of it. 
Um, but uh, we'd also be happy at XYS to uh, meet and talk. So even without a formal offering, if you want to come talk about this, we're happy to um, provide some light coaching to get you through it and mm -hmm. point you to uh, other resources. Great. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Great question, Sue. Uh, and it looks like we do have a couple more coming in for you. This one is from Jesse Perry. If you're using a model portfolios created by Vanguard or another large firm and implementing their models on your own, how does that change your responsibility as a CIO? It doesn't change it a ton. So if you're going to take in models from a third party, uh, you're still going to have to document your adoption of it. So what I mean is um, every time they make a change in their model, your records must show that you've reviewed and approved them. Um, so it might uh expedite or relieve some of the pressure to come up with uh, an initial template. Uh, that's certainly a, a bit of a relief and many, many advisors rely on Vanguard or DFA or other third parties for this. Um, but I'd say you still have the compliance responsibility to have really thorough records of your decision making on these things and um, especially documenting uh, the timing of changes and um, the fund replacements and that kind of stuff that come along with using third-party models. Great, great, excellent. Uh, a few more for you here. This one coming in from Alden Rowe. Publish this for you. At what point does a multi-advisor team actually need a CIO in general? We do some of this, some of these tasks in-house, and then our RA handles other tasks. Well, that's a good one. So um, in the uh, benchmarking surveys from uh, Schwab, they often show uh, the typical salary for a dedicated CIO. And of course, it's what you'd expect. It's, you know, in the range of 200,000, uh, but there's a variance depending on the size of the firm. So you're, you're probably um, going to base this decision on uh, available cash flow. If you can't afford it, then you can't afford it, and you'll all be wearing those hats inside of your firm. Uh, those, those of you who are planners are probably sharing those responsibilities. Um, but I definitely think that um, given a certain amount of complexity, you're going to cross that threshold or, or be forced to cross that threshold. And it's probably a certain number of um, activities or accounts. So if you associate 100 accounts with uh, weekly rebalancing, um, the 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 aggregate number of activities associated with that um, is probably a good measure. Uh, I say it that way because some firms rebalance quarterly and have um, high net worth clients. So you could have uh, 20 clients and $100 million under management and quarterly rebalancing, and you, you may not uh, see the justification for a CIO. Another firm with 100 million might have a thousand accounts and they might have weekly rebalancing. And so um, the aggregate sum of all of the trading activity is probably a good uh, threshold to consider, um, but also the amount of support needed. So if you've got a multi-advisor firm, uh, you might have six advisors who are uh, demanding more support on this front. They might need more questions answered, more uh, white papers or slides uh, to share with clients. And so I could see a firm um, of small AUM and low activity hiring a CIO because they need more support for multiple advisors. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at it the other way, I could see a big firm with low activity, a single advisor firm with high AUM uh, not needing it. So um, 
it's it's hard to give a really specific answer um, except that it probably has to do with one of those factors one more live question for you coming up here from kurt schrader what is the average expense ratio of the models utilized by xyis um that's a great one um Kurt, I'll get back to you with the specifics. I know it's low because um, costs are uh, one of our first considerations when we build a model. Um, we Our models are mostly comprised of very low cost stuff. Uh, the costs start creeping up in our models with more uh, DFA exposure and they creep up uh, another couple notches in our BRI model. Um, but beyond that, definitely um, very low. I'll make a note to follow up with you. Great. Great. Thanks for that, Jeff. And I'll jump back over to the pre-submitted questions, folks. Uh, but again, please feel free to continue to submit these live ones. This has been excellent. All right, Jeff. Uh, for those who are initially advice only, and then they add investment management later, um, this person had a few questions for you. So how hard is it to initially be advice only and then add that investment management offering later? Um, what do you think you know, is the hardest part of that transition? And how much time do you think this person should expect to spend on compliance? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't think it's necessarily hard. Um, if you don't have prior exposure to investment management, that might be the most prudent way to do it. Um, I think the biggest consideration in this uh, question you've posed is how comfortable does the client get with mm -hmm. your free advice on their assets held away? So let me kind of um, put some parameters around uh, this scenario. So pretend you're giving financial planning uh, for a fee. And that client has assets held away that periodically get feedback uh, from you as their financial planner. So they have assets in a 401k or maybe they're self-managing at Vanguard and you're giving them uh, some advice periodically on how to allocate that money. So in that case, when you go to add investment management for a new fee or for an increased uh, comprehensive fee, um, I think their first question is going to be, why would I do that if I can just say no and things will kind of continue the way they were? Mm -hmm. And um, you probably don't need to be overly afraid of that scenario, um, but that's, that's the only thing I can think of. Beyond that, uh, if you want to take baby steps and start with planning and add investment management later, I think that's uh, a really sound decision and uh, something you should consider if that sounds good for you. Um, in terms of uh, compliance considerations, I think the question was, what are the extra compliance hurdles that you'll have to jump through if you add investment management? And uh, it goes along with um, uh, all of these components of the presentation where we're talking about like documenting uh, model decisions, um, recording uh, changes in models. Now, if you've hired a TAMP, a lot of this stuff is going to be prepackaged for you. Um, like in our case, we provide lots of documentation on what's in the models and uh, documentation on when the models are changing and why. Uh, so all of that is easy to download and add to your compliance records. Um, ultimately, by having stepped into this business, um, you've assumed the responsibility to uh, take care of your compliance needs. And I always say that uh, this comes up a lot. I always say don't don't stress about the extra compliance that might be involved with investment management. Um, there's no question it's worth doing it. Um, I think just make sure that you're comfortable with 
the total scope of your service program, your service offering. So what I mean there is if your financial planning is filling all of your time and you can't imagine adding another uh, service and it's decided for you, it's a, a bad choice to add investment management. But for the most part, advisors are already uh, doing enough uh, immediately adjacent to the investments that adding investment management actually uh, relieves a little bit of the pressure and uh, they have a little bit more control and less uh, follow-up required to check on assets held away. I think that's the big trade-off is if you're not going to manage assets, you're going to get questions on the assets held elsewhere, or you can choose to add investment management and then you're the decision maker and um, ultimate uh, you know, owner of all of those investment decisions made on behalf of your clients. You're no longer dependent on them to follow through and to take your notes from a meeting and go uh, implement some bit of advice you gave them. Yeah. Keep them coming, people. Jeff is on fire right now. Uh, we got another live one for you here. I guess this kind of piggybacks off of what you just addressed, uh, Jeff, but, you know, what are some of the primary reasons you know, advice only advisors would choose to add investment management uh, as a service? Yeah, I think there's one headline here. It's that you're already getting so close to the investments. Um, if, if you're doing some comprehensive financial planning, uh, we know that you're going to be having in-depth conversations with your clients about that money. And so adding investment management gives you the power uh, to affect the ultimate outcomes. It's very easy for a financial planning only client to walk away from a meeting with their advisor and decide not to follow through on any recommendations given on those assets held away. And so that's it. There's just that one answer in my mind. You take on investment management, and you can uh, certainly, surely affect uh, the ultimate outcome for that client and make sure that your recommendations are actually put in place. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Monica. That was a great question. And then I'll hop back into the pre-submitted. And uh, we do have about seven minutes here, folks. So please, if any more uh, live questions are coming to mind, please submit those. Uh, okay, Jeff, I'm going to give you these two. Um, so what are some of the biggest challenges of being your own CIO? But then what are some of the biggest opportunities of also being your own CIO? Well, let me cater the question to this audience. So like I said before, this audience is uh, typically going to be planning first advisors or planning focused advisors. And the skills and uh, technical capabilities of the planning first advisor um, are different enough from those required by the CIO that I think it's a little bit of a stretch to assume that you can be a master of both, uh, both skill sets. Now, we certainly have a subset of this group, some percentage, who really can balance both. They really can uh, master empathy with their clients and be exceptional financial planners and communicators with their clients and also master the process and the due diligence required on the investment side. So you could, but I think for the most part, on average, this group is going to be far better at uh, that engagement and interaction with their client so much so that setting aside the investment management and letting another party be the CIO uh, by way of hiring out a CIO or hiring a TAMP, something like that is probably the better choice. Great insight. Thank you. And then there was one uh, question submitted to the chat, so I don't want this to get lost in the shuffle here. Uh, this is coming from Luis Guardia. Uh, does XYIS or is XYIS able to look at held away assets for asset location uh, at, at the household level? No, we don't have any uh, 
aggregation partners or tech. Um, <clears throat> but I would say that um, our advisors who need to uh, consider outside holdings in their asset location are able to do so because we're trading at the account level. So you can build uh, separate allocations for each account and uh, effectively manage asset location that way. It's not the best answer, certainly, but long term, uh, what I'm considering for uh, outside aggregation, the, the big question mark there is, can we find a technology that's reliable enough and priced right? Um, I, I'm constantly looking at the market for the right solution there. Um, so it's, it's something we could deploy easily and I hope to at some point, but I haven't yet found the, the perfect solution. Sure, sure. And again, folks, we are winding down here. So Jeff, do you have any last nuggets of information, wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience today? Um, I think the only other thing we haven't covered is um, you might want to uh, outsource trading. You might want to partner with a TAMP. Um, but you also could just outsource with a CIO, outsource a CIO uh, those services. So, for example, at XY Investment Solutions, we partner with East Bay Investment Solutions and Mario Nardone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in that case, they're effectively fulfilling our uh, chief investment strategist role and providing those services to us um, on a, a flat fee basis. So if any of you out there uh, need uh, to outsource this kind of work, but you still uh, hope to keep trading in-house, then uh, you might also consider an option like that. And uh, we, of course, would definitely uh, recommend East Bay Investment Solutions. They've been a great partner to us and uh, we're very happy with their their work. Yeah, Mario has been great to work with and you know he's been kind of affiliated with us uh, for some time now. And everyone, uh, we are closing in uh, at the top of the hour. So again, just wanted to mention that if you folks are interested in learning a little bit more about XYPN membership or XYS or TAMP, um, you're more than welcome to schedule a conversation with myself or Jeff. And when you click back to the lobby, you folks are gonna see a feedback survey pop up. And, and we would really appreciate it if, when you folks have the time, just take a moment to complete that. Uh, we'd love to know what you thought about the webinar what you found helpful. Um, Jeff provided us a lot of great information today. So again, want to thank everyone for joining us. And we really hope to see you guys at our webinar next month, uh, going into a little bit more about compliance. Well, got anything else for us today, Jeff? No, thanks so much, Chris. And thanks everybody for attending. This is great. Awesome. Thanks again, Jeff. Hope to see y'all next month. Take care, everyone.